Morning. Another day, another real world test. Today, we're doing it on the Google Pixel Fold, the first foldable from Google. And if you've noticed, I'm not in New York City, I'm in a hotel room. And that's because I'm on a work trip here in San Francisco with NTT for World Emoji Day, which we'll find out more about that and what that means later. As per the usual though, we're gonna test out this device all while we explore today. But first things first. Actually, today NTT has set up a coffee class of some sort with Sightglass Coffee, which is like a popular coffee shop here in San Francisco, which I am obviously excited about. Love that smell. Yeah, coffee. Check. So we're here at Sight Glass Coffee's first location on 7th Street in the Soma neighborhood of San Francisco. That also happens to be their main roastery, where they run a 1960s roaster 12 hours a day, every day, in 20 pound batches, every 15 minutes or so. It smells amazing in here. But now, we're going to do a pour over class. Pour over is a way of brewing coffee using a small, kind of looks like a vase contraption, filter on top of that and pouring the water in slowly using a gooseneck kettle to help control how slowly that pour comes out. Now I actually use this method at home to make my morning coffee a lot if I don't go out for an espresso drink, but I definitely do it in a much lazier way than what you're supposed to do most of the time. So it'll be fun to be forced to, to do the proper way and also kind of learn more about why it is done the way that it is. That was fun to have everybody like make their own and using a ton of different beans that just were roasted downstairs recently from different countries and see what like little things each of us did wrong, frankly. It's terrible. <laughs> Throw it out. <laughs> to see how those small changes affected the end result. Very cool. Okay, and now let's start with the Google Pixel Fold's hardware and the styling. And right off the bat, I, it feels great to me. And it's just this sandwich of metal and glass that just makes it feel really solid. We also have the unmistakable now pixel camera bar and matte glass back along with shiny sides. And we have two colors, the dark gray with the darker metal sides and the white with the more stainless steel metal sides. And it is definitely carrying over the same design language from the other new pixels. And in the same way, the materials and design kind of remind me of jewelry in a way, which I guess makes a lot of sense considering that Google's head of hardware design for a bit now, Ivy Ross, was a very successful jewelry designer. Go figure. Google also claims that this is the thinnest foldable on the market, which is true if the market in reference is the United States, as there are some from the Chinese only markets that are a bit thinner now. But point is, it's a thinner foldable. When folded and unfolded, it's thinner than the Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 4, but it's a decent chunk heftier. But regardless, it's nice and it kind of touches on one of the major pain points for a lot of people, I think, with foldable phones, which is the thickness. You will also, of course, notice that the aspect ratio is different than the Z Fold 4. And it's actually more like the Oppo Find N and the Find N 2. It creates this wider and shorter shape that I find myself liking more and more, as I've always just sort of complained that the outside display of the Z Fold series was a bit too narrow for me to feel like I could use it as a proper phone wall close. And I found myself just opening it a lot because of that. Whereas this feels a bit less necessary to do so. As I can, for example, type two-handed on this one, whereas I sort of found myself swiping more with the Fold 4. Well, my buddy that I share a studio with, Michael Fisher, aka Mr. Mobile, were chatting about the Pixel Fold's design, and he made the comment of how it reminded him of the Surface Duo for some reason, and I totally get it. Even putting the two side by side, the Pixel Fold almost feels like the folding screen version of Microsoft's dual screen Android phone. And who knows, maybe it'll be the format for the Surface Duo 3, if that ever materializes. It has a book-like quality to it as well that reminds me of those tiny moleskin notebooks. I feel like if I added a flap cover to the front and back and added the elastic band around it, it would easily fit the part. Sadly, unlike the Duo and the Fold 4, there is no pen support though, which 
would have been nice to see and make it even more like a moleskin mini notebook lookalike, maybe on the next model. It doesn't open all the way, which feels a little weird as it would be one thing if the hinge just stopped there, but it doesn't. You can still push it open further. So it kind of just feels like a weird design flaw. Regardless, it isn't a big deal. And if you couldn't tell by the intro, I love the feeling of closing it and the sound that it makes. Okay, as a nerd, this was actually very interesting to me. In honor of World Emoji Day, which I also just learned was a thing, NTT, or Nippon Telegraph and Telephone Company, a huge group of companies actually in Japan, set up a discussion about emoji with Yi Yin Lu, the artist who is responsible for not only the Twitter fail whale, but also created and helped submit the emoji applications for the dumpling, boba tea, and others. Rika Nakazawa, group vice president of NTT New Ventures, innovation and head of America's sustainability, and Marguerite Gong Hancock, vice president of innovation and programming and director of the Exponential Center of the Computer History Museum here in SF. Firstly, the emoji was actually created by NTT Docomo, the carrier under the NTT umbrella in Japan in 1999, in conjunction with iMode, they called it, which was the first cell phone internet connection service. In fact, the word emoji doesn't have anything to do with the word emotion, as a lot of people think. It's Japanese for e, picture, and moji, character. So it's literally describing a pictograph. Now people are already using normal characters in conjunction with each other to make smiley faces and winky faces and the like in 1990s chat rooms, but Japanese artist Shigetaka Kurita and his team working on iMode decided to create actual image representations of various things, and thus the original 176 emoji sketched out in 12 by 12 pixels and laid out on a keyboard-like grid were born. After the emoji were already popular across Japan, Apple and Google took notice, and in 2007, Google decided to petition the Unicode Consortium a nonprofit that maintains tech standards so that text is encoded and decoded the same across different computers, countries, languages, etc. In 2009, team members from both Google and Apple submitted an official proposal with 625 new emoji characters to be added to the Unicode standard, and in 2010, it was approved. Now since then, more and more have been officially added and there's a full process where you have to not only submit the artwork, but also the data to prove that it is compatible with the current emoji set, frequency of use or attempted use, and more. This is where Yi Yin came in and others to finally add some Asian-centric emoji and help people in that community feel more included. In a lot of ways, language itself, just like food, you have to expand your palate. And that's what we're we'll here for, to add more menu items onto the menu. And of course, there are many more being added to help others feel better able to express themselves and their communities. Okay, while we're here, let's talk about the folding screen of the Pixel Fold and some of the software features. Now, because of the wider and shorter outer display, the inner display, when you unfold it, is actually wider than it is tall. In fact, considering this screen is the same size and very close in resolution to the Fold 4, and there are only a handful of foldable screen manufacturers, there's a pretty good chance that this is the display from the Z Fold 4. Just bent the other way. Now, because of this though, as was the case with the Oppo Find N2, which I did a real world test while exploring the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas back in January, if you want to take a look at that, the link below, there is some weirdness when it comes to apps. Long and short of it, apps are usually made for phones. And since basically all phones are taller than they are wide, that's the aspect that they're designed for. Now, Samsung goes about this by adding their own way to usually force the app to stretch itself across the screen, but Google doesn't. So you get black bars on either side of the app. And there's a few reasons why Google does this most likely. You'll find that a lot of Google's own apps actually do what we all really want apps to do on this size of a display, which is change the UI to better suit a tablet-like size compared to just stretching everything. So things get an extra column, maybe more information is shown, etc. They also managed to convince some of their bigger partners like Microsoft to do this for some of their apps. A lot of messaging apps like Telegram and WhatsApp do it and a few others. Thing is though, that this isn't done on accident. It feels very much like this is Google trying to force app developers to create tablet versions and utilize some of the new Android version features specifically for foldables to make this experience more cohesive and just better for everyone. 
not allowing the app to use the bandit of just stretching kind of showcases which apps are not optimized. Will developers do it? Well, considering how crap of an experience it is, even on iPad still for a lot of apps, I'm not so sure. But here's to hoping. A workaround for the apps that aren't optimized like this, aka most of them, of course, is to actually rotate the screen 90 degrees and relaunch the app and it'll stretch better since again now it's taller than wide and more like a phone or the Galaxy Fold 4. I personally don't love that though because I'm the type of person that hates auto-rotate on my phones because it just always triggers when I don't want it to. Thankfully, there's a small thing that Google added here that I think all foldables now need to add, and that's the fact that you can turn on auto-rotate separately for the inner and outer displays. So I turn it on for the inner only, and that saves me a lot of unwanted rotations. Now, something I'm not a huge fan of when it comes to the two screens is the fact that unlike the Fold 4, you can't have a separate layout for the outside and inner displays. I kind of love that for the Fold 4 as I tend to use the outside and inner screens for different things. So being able to have different apps and widgets on each was nice. Is it a deal breaker? No. It's just would be nice to have. Now, besides the obvious benefit of a larger screen that you can fold into your pocket, there is another benefit that is inherent to all folding phones in general. The fact that the phone can be its own stand. Most folding phones have a multi-positionable hinge so that you can put it on a table and the folded part will stay where you put it. The Google Pixel Fold actually is a very sturdy hinge and is great for this. Now this allows you to put one app on the top part of the screen and say, watch content or do a video call like this in a very laptop-esque way. You can also do the same thing with the camera. And again, like most folding phones, even use the much better rear cameras to take a selfie of yourself using the outer display as your viewfinder. On the Pixel Fold, with the exception of the camera app, which will recognize that you folded the phone and automatically move itself to the upper half for all the other apps, you have to initiate a split screen view first and then put the app you want to see on the left side specifically and then a throwaway app that you don't really want to open on the other side just to put the one you want up. Now Samsung on the other hand recognizes automatically that the phone has been bent and it will put its own throwaway app on the bottom to push the screen up. It's basically a sort of useless control panel but it does the job intended so it doesn't really matter. It just shows again how Samsung's own workarounds and experience with foldables fills some of the gaps that Android and the Google Pixel Fold themselves haven't quite figured out. Okay, we're back at the W Hotel, which is where we're staying for this event, in the neighborhood of South of Market, named so because of being south of Market Street, the main road that was originally designed as a promenade in the mid 1800s. Now that road would eventually become the thoroughfare for the trolley and the public transit systems. Now this neighborhood is sometimes shortened to Soma to mimic the neighborhood in New York City called Soho, which actually stands for South of Houston Street, another major street there. Now it's where a large number of the museums and performing arts centers in San Francisco are, as well as the baseball stadium and a decent amount of tech startups. All right, while we're sitting still for a sec, let's talk about the cameras. And as Pixels are kind of known for their cameras, yes, here the Pixel Fold has pretty good cameras. Now, in spite of the fact that they are all different sensors compared to the Pixel 7 Pro. The main sensor is a 48 megapixel half inch sensor with 0.8 micron sized pixels compared to the 50 megapixel one by 1.3 one inch sensor with 1.2 micron sized pixels of the Pixel 7 Pro. Pro. Both sensors are binned in sets of four by default to get a 12 megapixel image with 1.6 micron size pixels from the Pixel Fold versus the 12.5 megapixel image from the 2.4 micron sized pixels of the Pixel 7 Pro. Then we have a five times optical zoom on the Pixel Fold, which is a 10.8 megapixel one by 3.1 inch sensor with 1.22 micron size pixels that aren't binned by default compared to the 48 megapixel one by 2.55 inch sensor with 0.7 micron size pixels that get binned in sets of four to get a 12 megapixel image with 1.4 micron size pixels when done on the Pixel 7 Pro. And the ultra wide is 1.2 megapixels smaller, but is basically the same 
on paper. For the telephoto in the main, the aperture of the lens, indicative of how much light the glass is capable of letting in, is faster, or lets in more light, by a small amount at least. Now, as always, the hardware tells part of the story, but so much is done on the processing and software side these days. You can tell the difference if I put the two side by side. One practical difference being the bokeh or the blur between the background and foreground is a bit more on the Pixel 7 Pro's main camera versus the Pixel Fold for example. And really the photos do look a bit different usually if you sit them next to each other. But really the photos coming out of here still look like they came from a Pixel phone and are very similar to the 7 Pro and all of that is a good thing. Now, truthfully, most flagship phones these days get a lot closer to the quality that Pixel phones were sort of known for thanks to everyone adopting more and more computational photography. But if I had to choose, I'd say the Pixel Fold does a better job at this still, if just not by as large of a gap as it used to. And of course, the five times telephoto compared to the three times of the Galaxy Fold 4 is going to just outright beat the Galaxy Fold 4 every time for anything that you want to get photos of beyond that three times range. I'm curious though, by the end of this video, what you guys think about all the photos that you've seen in this video. So let me know in the comments below. Now, speaking of things that the Pixel phones are known for that have carried over into this device, the battery is not great. In spite of the fact that it is one of the largest batteries in a foldable 48, 21 milliamps versus say the 4400 of the Fold 4, which is impressive considering that thickness again, it died relatively quickly today. Here is my screen on time and usage for anyone who's curious about that, but also keep in mind this is a real world test day and it's not a normal day as I use the camera way too much. So here is another day that was a much more normal day for you to compare it to. Now, Pixel battery life has definitely gotten better since the Pixel 6 or so, but it's still behind some of the devices by quite a bit. And so investing in a battery pack if you're out and about for a while with this phone, it's probably a good idea. Okay, calling it a night and uh, some final thoughts on the Google Pixel Fold. Firstly, Google doesn't really care if you buy the Pixel Fold or any Pixel for that matter. They never really have. They're not a hardware company. And the same goes for Surface from Microsoft and many Amazon devices that you see. Even though Surface does actually turn a profit now, that's kind of besides the point. They still aren't focused on selling any quantity of Surface products to consumers. And it's also partly why Google doesn't make an effort to sell their Pixel devices in as many countries. This phone, for example, is available in a whopping four countries at the time of me making this video. The US, the UK, Germany, and Japan. Compared to say the Fold 4, for example, being available in 130 plus countries shortly after launch. It's more of a PR move really for Google to show that they are competing and innovating compared to their rivals like Apple. But there is a bigger benefit here for consumers at least. In the same way that the Pixel lineup sort of compelled Android manufacturers to push their own Android phones further and before them the Nexus devices, the Pixel Fold has the potential at least to help push the foldable Android market forward. Maybe it'll push developers to optimize their apps for foldables and tablets, potentially not likely, but potentially. But more likely, it'll hopefully push Google to make more changes in Android itself for foldables and tablets now that they have a little bit of hardware and a team internally devoted to that hardware that can kind of advocate for those things. But hey, if nothing else, it is probably the best photos that you can get straight out of the camera on a foldable phone. So there's at least that. And there you go, guys. I will leave the best price that I could find on the Pixel Fold in the description below. And I'll try to keep that updated as always. But I would love to hear what you guys think of this phone, of this video, of my format, all that stuff. Always appreciate hearing from you guys in the comments below. And also subscribe and ding the bell so you're notified when I do new videos if you want to explore more places while we test out more tech. Now though, I am definitely still jet lagged and exhausted. So going to bed. Good night. And actually, do we really
really need that. Is that necessary? The beeping back of a truck. Of course, when the wind picks up. Find a quiet spot. Wind. <sighs> truck backing up somewhere. Everybody in the neighborhood needs to know. Well, it kind of looks. Cars, people screaming, cars, all the things, all the things, all the things, all the time. A pour over is a way of brewing coffee. Basketball, basketball dribbler. Screaming guy. And it is a 10 point. Someone's just starting a car in the alley. It's. Breeze. Wait for the breeze. Breeze feels good, but I'm gonna wait for it. Makes sounds. Is that a car or a plane? Now I hear a helicopter. Oh. There's the helicopter. They take, they take forever. You take a selfie of yourself. Motorcycle. Nope, helicopter. There's a lot. There's a lot of vehicles that make noise here. Hmm. As always. Phone? Telephone? Last time you heard a phone ring. The Google Pixel Fold actually is a very, nope, 